Hi, this is Dee Wallace, and you're listening to the Then Is Now podcast. Rise and shine, my sinners. When Father Evil starts his day, he gets a little deadly. Deadly Grounds Coffee has the richest, smoothest flavor you'll find anywhere. It's sinfully delicious. Once you go deadly, you never go back. Order yours at getdeadly.com. Coffee's so good, it's scary. Warning! Warning! Today's episode contains spoilers. So if you have not seen the movie or TV show that we are talking about, we highly recommend that you watch it first, then listen to this episode. Thank you. Welcome to 13 Days of Halloween. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another special episode of Then Is Now Podcast. I am your host, Rigor, and I am joined by my frequent guest co-host, who may or may not be my son, Spency. Hello. Oi, what's happening, dude? <laughs> How's it going? Good, good, good. Also joining us once again is my regular co-host on The East Meets the West, a man who has watched a film a day for the past 37 years, Patsy the Angry Nerd. Welcome, Pat. Oh, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. This is uh, this is going to be another fun one. You know, I, I think uh, I think this is going to be an interesting conversation because this is one of those movies that yeah, it's a little uh, it's a little different. It does. Uh, we were just talking about some uh, some video game stuff, and this does remind me of a little bit of uh, some video game stuff as well as some classic movies. So I'm excited to talk about it. Excellent, excellent. So, folks, we are continuing our yearly event called 13 Days of Hallowtober, and our theme this year is modern zombie films. And what that means is that we're not going to cover zombie films from before 1968, like White Zombie, I Walked with a Zombie, Teenage Zombies, and dozens of others. Uh, rather, we're covering the ones that came after and were inspired by George Romero's Night of the Living Dead in 1968. In the same way that Dracula from 1931 sort of laid down, laid down the ground rules for vampires in cinema, Romero's Night of the Living Dead did the same thing for zombies. So over on the East Meets the West, actually, Patsy and I have briefly touched upon what's called the deconstruction of the Spaghetti Western, which started a few years after the rules for those kind of films were sort of laid out. And what that means is that filmmakers... They, they try to do something outside of the regular formula that may have been set down in the first or original films of the genre. And today's film is definitely outside the box. So um, what we're going to discuss is the film Fido from 2006, starring Billy Connolly, Carrie Ann Moss, and Kaysen Loder. So sit back and prepare for a fun discussion. Class is in session. Good afternoon, boys and girls. So how many of you have ever had to kill a zombie? Well, not too many. What would we do without our zombies? <laughs> they take care of your jobs. Give me that. This is detail work. Flesh-eating maniacs need not apply. Do the housework. Oh, uh, what is that zombie doing in my easy boy? Uh, and play with the kids. Nice cat, Fido. Names are zombies, anyway. Mr. Theopolis has a name for his. I bet he does. Nicely done, Tammy. But for the sake of your neighbors, please keep them fed. Oh, jeez. That's Mrs. Henderson. We're in trouble, boy. Is that blood on your zombie? It was a nosebleed. You stupid zombie. Is Timmy in trouble? Families having to kill their own. I'd take Dee Dee's head off in a second if I had to. <laughs> he always said that. Is that bad? 
Yes. My God. Hold on. I don't want you thinking. What we did is normal or okay in any way. I don't. Right out. So without my job, we'd all be dead. Then where would we be? Dead. Dead. That's right. So this uh, this film takes place in a 1950s-esque alternate universe where radiation from space has turned the dead into zombies, which is the exact same plot as 1968's uh, Night of the Living Dead. That's uh, the explanation that we're given. Uh, so this results in the zombie wars where humanity battles zombies to prevent a zombie apocalypse, with humanity the ultimate victor. Sort of. Uh, there are still uh, what what's known as wild zones, uh, areas that are fenced off, and you know it's it's mentioned that there are no more prisons, and there's a specific reason for that. Uh, but the uh, radiation still plagues humanity, as all of those who die turn into the undead unless the body is disposed of by decapitation or cremation. Uh, in order to continue living normal lives, communities are fenced in with the help of the governing corporation named Zomcom. Uh, Zomcom provides callers with accompanying remote controls to control the zombies' hunger for flesh so as to use them as menial task servants. Zomcom is uh, sort of like Umbrella, or if you're familiar with uh, Repo the Genetic Opera, Geneco. You know, the one company that comes in and is the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. <laughs> So in the town of Willard, uh, housewife Helen Robinson, played by Carrie Ann Moss, which uh, you probably know her best from uh, either Memento or probably the Matrix trilogy, uh, buys a zombie, uh, played by Billy Connolly, in spite of her husband Bill, Dylan Baker, who I loved in uh, Trick or Treat, uh, despite of her husband's zombie phobia, as Bill had to kill his own father, who had become a zombie, and tried to eat him when he was 11. Uh, their son, uh, Timmy, played by... Uh, you had a different name than me. I have Case and Ray. Uh, oh, interesting. Uh, he befriends... What were you going to say? No, no, go ahead. Uh, he ends up becoming friends with the zombie. Um, yeah, it's different. I have Case and Loader on... Uh, and it's spelled different on IMDb, but on Wikipedia, it's Case and Ray, and I'm not sure why it's different. Uh, but he ends up... Oh, per- yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's weird. And they spell it's it in my wrong. notes that way, and I didn't even notice it. <laughs> uh, on IMDb, it's K-E-S-U-N, and on yeah. Wikipedia, it's K apostrophe capital S-U-N. Right. What is he, a Klingon? Maybe. Uh, he does befriend the zombie and name him Fido. Uh, little is revealed of his pre-zombie life, uh, referring to Fido, except that he likely died of a heart attack, as evidenced by his chest incision, uh, which uh, forces the uh, family to relive uh, 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 Bill's father, who died of a heart attack and became a zombie. Uh, so there were some painful memories associated with that. But uh, one day, Fido's collar malfunctions, and he accidentally kills one of their neighbors, who turns into a zombie. Uh, Timmy tries to kill the zombified neighbor later, but not before she kills and infects another person, causing a small zombie outbreak. Zomcon security forces quell the situation and then investigate what caused the outbreak. And uh, Timmy, being the hyper-intelligent child that he is, leaves a blood-covered baseball with his name on it at the scene of the crime. Uh, I will say quickly that this reminded me of the uh, one of the earliest Simpsons Halloween specials with the zombies. Uh, oh. Because uh, Timmy ends up killing and decapitating uh, uh, his, uh, his neighbor there and burying her in the uh, little garden that's in the park. And that reminded me of the scene where groundskeeper Willie was... Uh, heading down a flower bed, like a little garden area. He's like, they're pretty as a picture. And then zombies come up. He's like, ah, zombies! And then the zombies leave, and he pats the, the dirt back down. He goes, they're pretty as a picture, like nothing ever happened. <laughs> so when a pair of local bullies, who have been 
you know, harassing Timmy and even pulled a gun on him at one point uh, or get caught shooting a Zomcom officer. Uh, they are suspected of shooting the missing neighbor, but they point the blame on Fido, who hurt them when they tried bullying Timmy. Uh, Fido actually picked up one of the kids and heaved him, breaking his arm. Uh, the bullies later capture both Fido and Timmy, who are out for a walk in the country because they have their BB guns, although I would I would fight somebody if they just had a BB gun on me. I'd be like, Pfft. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this, and let me tell, let me uh, ask you if this reminded you of the same thing uh, it reminded me of. Uh, Fido escapes, and in a parody of Lassie, is sent by Timmy to go home and find help. What's wrong? Yes. Where's Timmy? Lead me to Timmy, right. boy. Like, <laughs> I 100% got Lassie vibes out of that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, even, well, we'll get into it later, but go ahead. Um uh, Helen uh, comes and rescues Timmy from the bullies who, through their own misadventure and Fido's hunger for human flesh, are now zombies because they're stupid. Uh, they uh, try to forget the whole thing. Several days later, the neighbor's body is quote-unquote uncovered, and the murder is traced back to Fido, who is taken away to ZomCon, where the family is told he will be destroyed. Timmy learns through uh, Cindy Bottoms, Alexa Fast, daughter of Jonathan Bottoms, Henry Zerny, uh, Zomcon's zealous security chief that Fido has been put to work in a factory at Zomcon. So Timmy sets out to rescue him with the help of Mr. Theopolis, the amazing Tim Blake Nelson, a previous Zomcon employee who was forced to leave when it was discovered that he was suspecting of fraternizing with his attractive female zombie. And, uh, yeah, I don't think there's, uh, there's, uh, yeah, th there's any question in my mind that he, uh, fraternized with this zombie <laughs> especially when you think about the uh the the one line he says to her over and over again no teeth not the teeth right uh so meanwhile that just hit me yeah <laughs> anyways uh meanwhile timmy locates fido but is captured by mr bottoms who attempts to throw timmy into the zombie infested wild zone which he doesn't attempt to he does uh, throw him out in, into the uh, the area outside the fence communities as punishment for his becoming attached to his zombie. Bill comes to the rescue, but is killed in a struggle with Mr. Bottoms, who is then in turn killed by Fido. Timmy is set free, and the news media states that ZomCon's security breach was the fault of rednecks who ventured out into the wild zone to hunt zombies for fun. Helen gives Bill the headless funeral he always wanted in order to prevent his zombification, and the film ends as Fido is a surrogate father to Timmy, Helen, and Helen's newborn baby, who doesn't get a name, because screw that kid. Uh, they, <laughs> along with the neighbors, happily enjoy their new domestic lives together, including the zombified Jonathan Bottoms, who is now under the control of his daughter. So, when did you guys see this for the first time? Spence? Oh, it came out when I was five. I just saw it today, <laughs> as of as of like an hour ago. From right this second of recording, I had just finished this movie for the first time. And that's funny because I thought I had showed this to you when you were younger, but I guess not. I was five. No, but yeah, when it came Between out. now, and, yeah, yeah, that was fifteen years ago. The, the I movies remember the are available once they uh, <laughs> once they come out. Like like you can watch them other than when they first come out it's like oh this movie came out in 1978 damn i wish i was alive then i should have been able to see it <laughs> for whatever reason i never ended up seeing yeah, it yeah i thought we did it was really it was really funny because i remember some moments from the trailer and i remember the movie existing and you know some of the funny tropes that were coming from it but i didn't ever see it so a lot of the fun stuff was you know a big surprise for me i, I probably talked about it over the years but pat remind me at one point i want to mention something about the trailer which i didn't get a chance to look into but i did not see this in the theater i don't think there was a wide release for it no um, i mean it was a canadian I, film right really which wow. yeah canada does exist spence i don't believe it um, but i do remember reading about it around the time it was released and i remember you know, looking forward to it. And when it was soon, it was and, uh, as soon as it was on uh, video, I rented it and um, I loved it. I enjoyed the brilliance. Um, I think I've only revisited it once or twice since then, but I guess I did. I thought I had shown it to you, but I guess not. So I was glad to revisit it this time because I, I picked up like way more this time around than I did even the first time around back in 2006. When it came out. I watched this the first time. Uh, I want to say, 
Uh, let's see. My wife and I had just started dating, so it was around 2009, 2010. I think we picked this up. Uh, there was a blockbuster video that was near my parents' house, and they would always have like the you know three for twenty or four for twenty sale, and we would go and we would you know get a bunch of movies that looked good, and then we would watch them. Um, and this, I believe, was one of them. You know, because we were on a zombie movie kick, and we were trying to like find some interesting stuff. And that was the the last time I had seen it. I hadn't really watched it until again today. You know, like you like you guys uh, about an hour ago. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad because there was a lot of stuff that I did not remember. Um, so it was a good thing that I I rewatched it because, I mean, I remember definite sexual tension between Carrie Ann Moss and, and, and Fido. Like, I remember <laughs> that. I was like, man, if he had a heartbeat, like she definitely banged that zombie. Um, <laughs> like I remember, yeah, that I didn't stuff. remember that element of it. Like that was all I remembered. Like I didn't. And I remember, you know, uh, you know, Dylan Baker, who I love because he's just so like quirky and, and, like he definitely fits this movie's aesthetic, you know, of taking place in the 1950s. Oh yeah. Um, like he is perfect for that. Like you know, leave it to Beaver, my three sons, you know, that type of dad. He has the look, the voice, the mannerisms. Like that's just, which is again he, he, why he, I love him in Trick or Treat. Yes, he's got that. He looks like a living Jim Aparo drawing. Yes. Yeah. And. You know, I, I just he's he's just he's perfect for this role. Carrie Ann Moss does a great job because I think this is one of the first things she did uh, post Matrix Three. Because I didn't I don't remember her in anything else, and I was like, wow, the Matrix lady is going to be in this. Like, all right, let's see how it works. And <laughs> she was she was excellent. Um, oh yeah, because I had seen this before I had seen um, uh, Memento. Which again, another uh, great movie with some some excellent acting in it. But yes, um, but yeah, I, I hadn't seen her, uh, and I think the last thing I saw her in was Jessica Jones. I think was the last thing I, I watched her in. Yeah, she was in all those Marvel um, shows on Netflix: uh, Daredevil, The Defenders, Iron Fist. Yeah, because she was she was like a lawyer for somebody, like, and she was yeah. involved with a bunch of stuff. And I thought it it worked out well for her. She didn't have any fight scenes, which you know, little little unfortunate <laughs> because you know she could do it. Ah, uh, yes, that's the whole plot of all those Marvel shows: is watching our lawyers get into fights. Well, I mean, Daredevil is. Yeah, he's I mean, also the main character. Yeah, well, but he's know. he's he's a lawyer. Like that's yeah. like I know you were trying to be facetious, but it's like yes, that's literally what Daredevil does. <laughs> we're gonna see that in the She Hulk when that comes out. Oh yeah, yeah, because she's also right. a lawyer too. Jennifer Walters is a lawyer. That's right. Yeah. So, see, you're trying to be facetious, and like you're literally describing two of the shows. <laughs> but um. But Spence, you mentioned uh, when we when we saw Dylan Baker show up, you were like, "Oh my God, that's oh yeah." Um, Dylan Baker, the the father, Bill Robinson. He, I pegged him instantly. He's Doctor Kirk Connors from the first uh, Sam Raimi Spider Man trilogy. Yes, and that was that was instant for me. As and even Carrie Ann Moss, I was looking at her face, and I'm usually a voice person when it comes to placing people, but when I was looking at her face, I'm like. Is that Carrie Ann Moss? And then she kind of like came into view a bit better. I was like, wow, that was, I'm right. That was interesting. And same with um, Dylan Baker. Uh, it took me a little while for. Um, Tim Blake Nelson. Yes. It took me a little while for him because I had to listen to his voice. I didn't recognize him immediately. But to me, he is uh, from the Incredible Hulk, Mr. Blue, that yeah. that other scientist that worked with Bruce Banner. And so that was a really cool revelation for me that, you know three of these actors I've at least seen in other things. The you know? leader. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's uh, yeah. like Still waiting for it. Yeah, I know. But uh, he was also in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? That's right. Yeah. He was also in uh, a more recent film that I thought was excellent. Uh, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Oh, um, I didn't see that. Oh, right. yeah. He's oh, that's that's excellent. It's a it's an anthology film uh, and he's in like the first the first section of it. Uh, he also was phenomenal 
in the HBO Watchmen series. Oh, yeah, I haven't had a chance to watch that either. <laughs> oh, yeah, he is he is awesome. He's so good in that. Uh but yeah, I I definitely recommend that one if you haven't seen it. Yeah, it's on my list. Um so uh you know for me Henry Zerny mm-hmm. uh, who played Jonathan Bottoms, he'll always be Kittredge from the first Mission Impossible film. See, I I recognized him and I was like, oh, "Who is this guy?" Uh cuz I didn't really watch any of the Mission Impossible movies. What? I haven't seen any of them, but uh oh, the dad from Ready or Not, like have you guys seen that one? No. No. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Ready or Not is one of the best horror movies that came out in 2019. Uh, it's the one with oh. Samara Weaving where she gets uh, married and like the night of their wedding, they have to do, uh, they have to play hide and seek. And she, if she, sur- she has to get killed before the sun rises. Otherwise, like something bad will happen to the family. Like it's heavily implied that they got their fortune from a deal with the devil and he's he's the dad of the family it's so oh, wow. good like it was one of the the final movies that we saw in the theater and samara weaving is phenomenal in it uh, i a million percent recommend uh watching that one oh I'll have to check that out ready or not oh it's so good it's so and he is he's a similar character, except he's like there's more of a comedic bent to it. Like it's definitely a, a horror comedy, like Fido is. But yeah, yeah, like this, I, I yeah, definitely watch that. It's it's amazing. <laughs> That's cool. Now the, the director Andrew Curry, um, I didn't. He didn't seem like he's done too many things, and uh, I haven't heard of any of his pictures because probably because he's a Canadian director, but. Um, it's really too bad because this movie was so well shot that I really felt like he could have gone on to bigger things, you know? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's tough. Um, you know, sometimes you only get like that one shot and where Fido didn't have this huge, this huge, you know, wide release, like it kind of flew under the radar. It's almost like a, uh, you know, like an independent film, like, Right, right. They only they only shot it. It only took thirty five days to shoot. I yeah, I really liked the cinematography of the film. There's a lot of small shots and small ch- design choices that really made a big difference. You know, when say one of the zombies was off its collar, the camera would get that Dutch tilt a little bit mm-hmm. and just kind of give that that air of like confusion and chaos, which I thought was awesome. And then there's some moments where the the family is burning this little cabin down to yeah. cover evidence up. And there's a whole shot of Fido, the kid, and Carrie Ann Moss, like, standing there in the fires, right, is right behind them. And they're just dark silhouettes. And it looks like a nice family photo, right. except for the fact that one of them's a zombie and they're standing in front of a burning building. So it was small things like that that I was like, oh, wow, that was a really cool thing that they did. Yeah. I, and, it's, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I love the fact that they take, you know, these – these typical, you know, like we talked about, like a Lassie or, you know, a, a, you know, one of these 50s sitcoms where, you know, the dad comes home and the wife has a martini for him and like dinner is ready. And, you yeah. know, everybody drives like the specific car, which has the hood ornament of the Z to show you how far reaching uh, Zomcon really is. And that's true. They just they come home and like it's like the sensibilities of like a 50s sitcom coupled with like the violence and gore of, you know, a modern zombie film. And like right, the right. two things together are so out of place. Like they're such opposite ends of the spectrum. Like they don't even have like they don't even share a bed. Like they have the two bed yeah. the two twin beds separated <laughs> by a nightstand. Right. You know, and yet somehow she gets pregnant. I <laughs> No, no, I no, totally you're just gaining weight. Yeah, the writing in this film is awesome. Yeah. I thought there was so many of just so many small lines and so many moments that were just almost one-off moments, but they were totally riffing on the '50s stuff. And then when zombies were thrown into the mix, it just made it worse. Because at the very beginning, you've got the, like this preamble film that gives a description of the zombie wars and stuff, and it's 
it it sounds like you know one of those like fifties um news Cold reels. war movies like oh yeah, yeah we're gonna you know we're America this is great we had we did awesome it's like oh we always got to watch out for the elderly <laughs> we can't trust them and so many so many things like that that really made me smile and I really enjoyed because it was just clear clear uh, attention to detail in the writing and you know some of the lines and the characters were super consistent uh, i don't know it was the writer of, of this movie whoever it was plus the director an awesome combination for all the finer details well it was written by andrew curry robert chomiak and dennis heaton and the story is by dennis heaton right he's another one he produced a bunch of films and tv shows but we've never heard of pretty much most of them um, but Robert Chomiak, uh, he did English adaptation, adaptations for a few anime shows, including Mobile Suit Gundam Seed. Oh, very Everyone's cool. heard of that. And he did write an episode of a show called Alienated, which I believe was popular at some point. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm familiar with, with those. But, again, there's so many people who have done so many things. You know, like if, if we end up getting to Pontypool, like – that that's one that's like who is this guy what is this like most of it takes place in a uh, a radio station mm. yeah it's 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 weird but cool yeah definitely want to check that something out. i was thinking about uh during fido was i mean i'm a drama nerd to an extent i did a lot of that in high school but uh, yeah, among other things and when I was look, was watching this movie, I was like, "This would be really awesome to do." Is like one of those really quick, funny stage plays that you could do for. Uh, I had some more more competitive things where you had a limited time to do stuff, and you could really trim Fido down and make it a pretty funny comedy, of you know this family and then the zombies and giving everything quick two minutes for the preamble and the characters. You know, weren't too many characters. It was a, a main cast that we've addressed so far and. After that, everyone else is relatively extras, or they die, um, or both. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or they're extra dead people. So um, I don't know. There's, that was one of those things that I always like about movies is if you can trim it down and turn it into one of those quality, almost stage comedies. I think that's just a sign of a good film that gets to the point, but also has all this good extra stuff that isn't fluff or filler. Right, right. Or it is, but it serves a specific purpose. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And obviously there's always, you know, some foreshadowing. You know, it's like, ooh, now that he's here, this is going to be the safest town. Like, oh, we're super safe now. And then, like, <laughs> naturally you're not. Yeah. You know, and everybody's measuring their wealth by how many zombies they have. I have to say, when I watched this yesterday, my first impression, I mean, I had, like I said, I had seen it when it came out, but um, I didn't really remember it either. But I, I felt that the portrayal of the men was I, – I didn't like it because I felt the father was weak. Um, you know, Jonathan Bottoms was nefarious, and Theopolis was creepy, although Theopolis is the one who ends up, you know, getting into action and really being one of the few main male characters that does something positive for the – to move the story forward. But – yeah, I wasn't too I wasn't too bothered by that because they they characterized Fido just as well. Um, so I mean, I w upon watching it, at least for the first time, it felt like every character served a purpose. Even the father has his little character arc of kind of coming to terms with the fact that he's too obsessed with funerals, and since they're more expensive in this world, he kind of comes to that fact. And at the at the end of the movie, goes to actually rescue his son. Right. And, you know, that, that was that's cool what I was moment. trying to get at, though, was because when I watched it today with you, I got a little bit more out of it. I felt that oh, society's broken. Everybody's broken. I mean, they fall into the whole 1950s pit of not talking about things like we're not going to talk about the bullies. Oh, my God. What will the neighbors think? You know, that kind of thing. But the father's broken because his father turned into a zombie, tried to kill him. I think Kittredge, not Kittredge, Bottoms is broken. <laughs> Because he fought in the war. He's probably got shell shock. And, you know, the, one of the newspaper headlines said he had 500 kills. So he's focused on containing it and securing everything and to the point of madness. Yeah, he still had his, uh, you know, his first kill in a jar in his house. He had the skull of, uh, you know. Uncle Bob. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, I get, you know, Dylan Baker's whole whole thing is like he was 11 and had to kill a zombie. Like. Right. And it was his dad. 
you know, he even brings that up. He goes, I'm a great dad. My dad tried to eat me. Did I ever try to eat Timmy? I don't think so. Like, <laughs> like that's the only thing. It's like, oh, I never tried to cannibalize my son. That's why I'm a great dad. Yeah. You know, Very and, low bar. And he's not a great dad. And he's no. not a great husband. Like, again, doesn't notice that his wife is pregnant. Right. Like... Like really, how often do you guys even have sex? Like in your in your twin beds, separated by a, a nightstand. One of my favorite details of the entire movie was when she tells him that he's pre- that she's pregnant. The magazine that he's reading is Death instead of Life. Yeah. I right. thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Oh man. I guess um, let's talk about Billy Conley for a little bit because um, he was reportedly very upset that the role required him to shave his beard because he described it as ripping out my fucking personality. <laughs> um, so did you know who he was, uh, Pat, before you saw this movie? Uh, before I saw it in uh, 2009 or 10? No. But, you know, now I do. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, Spence, you? No, I, I really don't know him all that well i mean once again he didn't have any real uh, cohesive speaking lines right so right. that's that's how i place people more than anything else unless they're somebody who i i know by name and i could put a name to the face it's really hard for me so i especially the fact that i didn't know anything else that he'd been in you mentioned one thing that i had seen that he was in even so briefly um oh, so i yeah it was was the Boondock Saints. He was yeah. He was Il Duce, the father. Yeah. So I've only seen that once, which is good. It was a good movie, but I've only seen that once, so I don't really know this actor very well. Yeah. Especially not when he's. See, I remember him different. from his stand-up. He was a stand-up comedian a long time ago, and then he was on. I forget. There was one sitcom he was on in the early '90s. Then he had got his own show called Billy, and I remember specifically watching that because of him. I used to be a nice person, and I suppose I'm still the same guy I always was. But I've been kind of brave. I say no sometimes. I did it today in the hotel in the Four Seasons. A woman came over. I was smoking a cigar. And she said, excuse me, my uh, friend is sensitive to smoke. Could you put it out? I thought, you're not too fucking sensitive, are you? This is sensitive to fuck all. This one's got stainless steel underwear on it. I said, no, I don't think so. Excuse me, she says. Excuse me? I said, I'm in the bar. I'm in the bar, smoking. She's sensitive to smoke. What's she fucking doing in here? She says, we're expecting friends. I said, I don't give a fuck you're expecting twins. Which she took umbrage. I said, you've got every room in the hotel. You've got outside in the garden with a wee cup of tea tables. You've got the next door there, the lounge. You've got the little foyer. You can book a room and have a cup of tea. This is the only room you can smoke. But you want me to put out so you can sit. And the only room on the line is fucking smoke! I'm getting tired of the tobacco police. Andy was in the Hobbit movies. That's right. That's right. Which came much later. More, yeah, much like, more recently. But it's like, you know, you gotta, you gotta remember him from Boondock, where it's like, it's like, oh, it wasn't you know, six men with guns. It was one man with six guns. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh man. But I guess um, Peter Stormari was supposed to uh, play Fido. He got cast in the role, but then um, he ended up getting cast in Prison Break and decided to go with that instead. Yeah, he's, and, uh, you he, may... he's better, at, you know, instead of being a zombie, he's better at playing, like, you know, a Russian gangster. Like, that's... Right. Or a Russian cosmonaut. You know, I was going to say Armageddon. <laughs> Armageddon, uh, you know, he's always Russian in something. Plus, uh, right. like in, uh, shit, uh, John Wick 2. 
Um, yes. <laughs> now that you, I, I, as soon as you said the name, I was like, wait, he's the one from John Wick too. I also pegged his voice. He voice acted in. Uh, there was the animated show back in the early two thousands, The Batman. There was an animated movie of Batman versus Dracula. He voiced Dracula, uh, and yeah. then funny enough, a few years later, he voiced one of Dracula's henchmen in the first season of Castlevania. Oh, that's. Funny. I heard yes. his voice instantly yeah, when yeah. I was watching those. Oh yeah, Peter Stormare has a very, very uh, distinctive voice. Plus, he's just—he's yeah. just—he's one of those guys that, like, if you add him to a movie, it's gonna be—it's gonna make it better. Like, right. doesn't matter that's what why, his role why, is. Oh yeah, and that's why I first saw him was Prison Break. I, I do love though, like you said, the whole nods to Lassie. You know, he's just. He just treats Fido. He names him Fido. Fido is like what the most common dog name in the world. Or it used to be, yeah. Like or that was, be, yeah. you know, because he's looking at him as, you know, these are domesticated creatures. You know, they don't, they don't know what the backstory is. They don't care that much. Although he did have a little bit of, uh, of bub in him. You know, yes. especially where, you know, he was protecting the kid, but also. He refused to eat him or carry Ann Moss because he he recognized them that they were good to him. They didn't try to hurt him. So, right. Did you have something to say? I can't remember what I was about to say. Something about Lassie, and um, you know, it fed into the a lot of the fifties tropes, which was really funny. Oh, Oh, uh, he said something about um domesticated oh they even refer to the zombies that are attacking people as wild zombies right they're like oh why you know why were you dealing with the wild zombies in this way and i was i remember hearing that i'm like oh i guess they consider the ones with collars to be domesticated i guess that checks out that that sounds right (laughs) yeah because they even have the they have the Mm -hmm. ones in the wild zone you know it's almost like a like a safari Right, <laughs> like a new predator has just arrived, as if it wasn't other human beings now dead. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I like the fact that you know some of the questions that Timmy asks, uh, especially at the beginning when we first get to meet uh, uh, Jonathan Bottoms there. Um, you know, like, oh, are they alive or dead? And it was like, oh, that's a stupid question. It's like, is it though? Is right. it? And he doesn't answer it. And he's yeah. like, what about the ones that are buried that are still trying to climb up out of the out of the ground? You know, and the first yeah. time I saw that, I was like, oh, maybe they'll uh, maybe they'll like something will happen or maybe there's a sequel or whatever. I don't know. But I don't think this needs a sequel. I think this is one of those no. nice self-contained films. I did like the uh, outdoor activities that the kids were participating in. And you get to that see uh, <laughs> Cindy shooting the zombie in the head and then shooting across the neck. So the head falls off. Yeah. <laughs> That was awesome. I will say, though, one thing that kind of bugged me is Tammy got shot in the head. And it was it, okay. it was like in her, the top of her forehead. It was in the top, yeah. It sort of grazed the, the top. So I think it was more mm. mostly skull. I don't think it destroyed the brain enough to have yeah. ruined her. But there was he did something weird to her at the end. Was she have like a mask on or something? Or? He uh, yeah, he put her in like a bonnet and everything. And he was like he totally changed the roles of their relationship. Like, he yeah. was waiting on her now because, you know, obviously he did care about... And that's how you can tell this as a 50s sensibility. You know, like, instead of, you son of a bitch, it was like, you knucklehead! Like... Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I appreciated that. The the best line in the movie, though, is, I didn't catch it till this time around, was when she uh, Carrie Ann Moss is in the car with Bub, and she looks at him and she goes, why aren't you eating me? And it was just all of a sudden the double meaning dawned on me. <laughs> you mean you mean Fido? Yeah, yeah. You called him Bub. <laughs> oh, I said Bub. Yeah. I meant Fido. I thought well, you, you know, did that intentionally. See how how much he reminds you. Like I think that's like any time you have a an intelligent zombie that kind of stands out from the crowd from you know from all that's the other funny. you know mindless ones. You know the first one you're going to think of if you're a zombie aficionado is Bub. So. It's Bub, yeah. I kept thinking, and Spence is making a face here. He doesn't I, know. No I think idea. Bub came, came up in our Shaun of the Dead conversation, too. Is Yes. Um, the movie, the, Romero's third zombie film, Day of the Dead, there was a scientist who had a zombie chained up, and he was experimenting on him to try and domesticate him, and his name was Bub. 
and he's beloved by the fans. We're gonna have to watch that at some point. Oh, it's excellent. Really I have I have uh, I have a Bub action figure that's still in the package. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. He's that's who uh, we mentioned it in the Shaun of the Dead episode because that's who Sean is uh, mimicking when he does his zombie impression. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Howard Sherman, I believe, played uh, played Bub. And I, I loved when the, the kids had shooting class and they had their little song, In the brain and not the chest, headshots are the very best. <laughs> yeah, just over and over and over. Uh, I'm trying to remember when we watched this, and it's funny because it came up in the suggested videos. Uh, it was this and uh, Warm Bodies was the other one that came up. I was thinking about that movie when we were watching it. I'm like, wow, oh, yeah, this is kind of similar with the whole, you know, zombies have a personality, you know bit of bit of life in them that beyond just being supernatural animated creatures is that the rom com yes. yeah the one with nicholas holt and uh rob cordry i don't know if i saw that you, or you've I, seen uh, that uh, john malkovich once. okay it's it's very oh yes very similar to romeo and juliet yeah and like there's the zombies and then there's like the weird skeletal zombies I actually really liked that aspect of the movie. I'm a sucker for cool monsters. So yeah. something like that I thought was pretty cool that, you know, it kind of almost like takes after Fido. Because I know it came, this that movie came out after Fido, um, but it kind of takes in the same vein of, you know, oh, we have an emotional connection to the zombie and maybe the zombie has an emotional connection back. Right. And, you know, that was pretty, that was pretty cool for comparing the two of them in story. Hi, this is Rigor, host of Then Is Now podcast and The East Meets the West. I just wanted to say thank you to all of our Patreon subscribers. We appreciate your support as we grow the audience for our shows. You could find our links to our Patreon page as well as our Tee Public page at havenpodcasts.com. With Patreon, you'll get a lot of exclusive stuff, including our monthly pop culture newsletter, cool gifts, discounts for Tee Public, and our special exclusive show, Then Is Now Filmmakers Series, in which we interview directors, producers, writers, composers, special effects guys, basically anybody who works behind the scenes in film and television and get their insights into the process of creating films and TV shows. Also at our Tee Public page, you'll find cool merch that you can get or even give to others as gifts. You can find those links at our website, or you can go directly to tpublic.com slash stores slash Haven Podcasts and patreon.com slash then is now podcast. Enjoy. Are you a lifelong fan of General Hospital? Are you a new fan who wants to know more about the history of the show? Do you enjoy talking about the show with others? Do you find yourself yelling at the TV? Is your self-care an hour a day in Port Charles? If so, we invite you to join hosts Amanda Kimmel and Shannon Coach at the place where all the hidden conversations take place and secrets are revealed. Meet us at Pier 54, a General Hospital fan podcast. Shark Bites, Shark Bites podcast. It's the greatest show in history. From the Dorkening Network. Hosted by a nerd who's named Patsy. From movie reviews to tips on surviving the coronavirus, Shark Bites has it all. Follow us on Facebook and suggest topics at sharkbitespod at gmail.com. Available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Yeah, there was there was a lot of uh, zombie stuff that came out in the early 2000s, but like between 2000 and 2010, because you know they were trying to continue the Romero series. There was Survival of the Dead, Diary of the Dead, um, you know, Fido, Shaun of the Dead, um, the the Day of the Dead, uh, Contagion, Day of the Dead one and two, uh, the remake of uh, uh, Dawn of the Dead, Zack Snyder. I think that came out in 06. So I do was, like that one. Oh, I love it. I thought it was great and, you know, some great uh, casting choices. But, like, the whole, throughout the whole, um, like, the whole, you know, 2000 to 2010, like, there were just so many zombie movies that came out. And, it's like, you could do an entire month, like, one a day on, you know, movies that came out in that time period that are, yeah. you know, fairly high quality and yeah. just talk about, 
zombie movies just nonstop. Yeah, because uh, I think uh, Land of the Dead came out in 2004? I think so, yeah. Um, so shortly after Shaun of the Dead, you know, and there's just so many of these movies that, uh, you know, we're trying to reinvent the genre, and you got some, like, really cool mashup, mashups, you know, like this, like Pontypool, like uh, Doghouse, you know, so there was a lot of uh, a lot of people who were, you know, like clearly zombie fans, and you know, like it, it all depends on who your your influence is. You know, it's so, like this one is clearly Romero because they're like, oh, the zombies want to eat your flesh. Right. And if you were, you know, Dan O'Bannon in uh, what was it? 80, Return of the Living. Yeah, I was going to say eighty four. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's when they first started eating brains and were pretty much unkillable. Like, right. even you know, like pickaxe to the brain doesn't matter. Or oh, the 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 what do you call it? The um the dog that sliced in half for medical purposes. Yeah, was still was barking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, yeah. Um, there was definitely a matter of taking Fido in a specific way because they definitely ignored the whole acting as a contagion it was just a matter of yeah because of the radiation after you die so you don't have to worry about somebody you could get you could t get a bite taken out of you and if you survive you're fine you know like nelson think, um, had a bite right I yeah his name yeah he he showed a, he showed a bite mark from dealing Tammy. with his girlfriend <laughs> and uh that that was you know that was kind of one of those moments where they establish in the mythos of the movie okay it's not an infection it's just yeah it's the radiation it's infecting everybody back. Which is, you know, and that and that that checks out. Oh, okay. I didn't. I was wondering about that. I'm like, how can he have a scar from the bite? Wouldn't he have turned? And I kind of forgot. About I that. mean, I when I walk into this movie, I'm thinking, okay, I know the general idea of how zombie movies typically go, but they kind of established at the very beginning of the the corpses were coming back to life. But, you know, it wasn't some disease that was killing people. It was, it was literally just animals that happened to be decom decomposing bodies of people. And, you know, one thing I really, I thought was really interesting about this movie was that, like, for example, on Walking Dead, uh, a lot of the main plot lines involve the main characters trying to find a base of operations that's safe, that's walled off, that they can defend. And in this, you know, well, actually, what I want to say here is twofold, because then you've got ZomCon, who's sort of this government paramilitary kind of thing that's basically, it's martial law all the time. But it's not, it, it really is there for everyone's benefit. They are there to protect everyone from the zombies. So it has this oppressive undertone, yet when you think about it, all the cities and towns now have some kind of fence or wall around them. And everything in between is the, the what do they call it, the wildlands, you said? The wild zone. The wild zone. So, but you, they never, except for that one scene towards the end where the zombies get through the fence, they never focus on that at all. Like you don't, you living in the town, you don't even know there's a fence around it. I mean, you know that there is. Like you, there are certain rules that you're living under. You know, like you're right, saying. Right, but I meant like, from a viewer's point of view. Right. Yeah. You know, but you know, they mention it at the beginning. You know, only to pay it off at the end, which is nice because, like, you see this picturesque '50s town, and then you see the 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 uh, wild zone, and it's just like desolate dead trees you know yeah. just awful there's a lot of media that takes you know a slice of life from the society they're presenting to you almost like it's a dystopian and then all of a sudden this character gets wrapped up in potentially having massive cultural legal changes it happens all the time i mean even in like the hunger games books and movies eventually this character who's a part of this society that does this thing eventually changes that somehow it happens all the time but that didn't happen here this wasn't some toppling zomcom and you know giving everything back to the people it was just a matter of we just want the family back together and we keep accidentally killing people incriminating <laughs> ourselves that's the problem just right because and, we did that doesn't make it okay <laughs> and they they blame everything on you know people who are already dead so it's like all right they're already right. dead they can't contradict us you know so yeah. it makes you wonder how long they've been doing this you know this is definitely an oppressive regime but you don't know that you're being oppressed you know like they right. even say like oh how do you think they got that house you know it's like because 
their zombie killed a bunch of Christmas carolers, and they were sent to the wild zone. But even you know, like, so, it, it's a matter of, like, whenever something happens that zo- that Zomcom seems to, you know, send somebody out, it's a matter of, like, you let a zombie loose. You let, you let a potential, you know, wild animal that's arguably one of the worst predators humanity has ever seen out to just hang out in the town at some point, even if it was an accident. So that's the only time I've seen that they actually deal with it. There's not a whole lot of having to deal with common petty crime it seems like everyone's living okay until you start actually throwing quote-unquote domesticated zombies into the mix right well what what was the what was the line that they said you know there are no prisons so you know right because the towns themselves are prisons and and what did they do with the prisons the prisons are retirement homes Oh, that's right. I yeah. forgot about that. That's yeah. where the old so they take all the old people and they put them in there. So if they turn, they just, oh, just lock down. Right. And so, like, there's that aspect that they don't really touch on. And if you commit a crime, you know, it's like, oh, well, you did this. I do like your house. Uh, yeah. Wild zone it is. <laughs> like, there was no crime because right. everybody knew what the penalty. I mean, that's a hell of a deterrent. Yeah. You know, and yes, you know, the people who, you know, they discussed, it's like, yeah, they accidentally did this or they accidentally did that. Like, and then you see the, uh, the guys at the end who were, uh, you know, hunting, hunting the zombies for sport. Zombie like, poachers. Poachers, yeah. <laughs> and where did they go? They went into the wild zone just this yeah. time without their guns. And, so, yeah. I mean, that's their solution to everything. Oh, shoplifting? Psh, wild zone. But right. we also see... Zomcon using that to influence behavior like that's true oh we could send you into the into the wild zone but we were assured that this would never happen again so you know yeah and but there's also a matter of like as 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 much as we're describing it it definitely sounds really bad on Zomcom's part Think of how people reacted to the moment there was one wild zombie. I mean, the main kid got a good lick in with that with the grandmother who ended up turning into the zombie. And that was like the one time we saw him really kill a zombie. A lot of people were terrible shots. Oh, they the whole... all had stormtrooper aim except for the daughter of the well, of the main of the main dude. Everyone else like was terrible. Like, and the, the Girl Scout. The zombies move at like two miles per hour, and these people are standing there with guns failing to hit them in the head, which is not a very hard target at 10 feet away. But the zombies managed to get close enough to kill multiple guards. These And these are not like citizens with guns who never use them. These are the Zomcom guards who all end up getting killed or they end up they end up shooting somebody in the leg or something right. like that. It, it's one of those things where, as, much, as bad as it sounds, when people react to zombies, they're terrible. Even the trained guards are terrible at dealing with them. So it almost is... It's a necessary evil in this world. It's written that way. Well, and that's the thing is, you know, you know, when you you take and this is one of the reasons why I really enjoy the Netflix series Black Summer, because you have the the zombies. So pretty basically anybody who dies becomes a zombie. I don't know if you guys have seen this one yet. No. And they make it much more realistic because it's not like the walking dead was like oh no we're all surrounded by zombies that's okay because everyone's a fucking expert marksman and (laughs) there's no chance like every shot is a headshot like that's not real life like there's a scene in the second season where there's like this group uh this militia group and one of them is is a cop and there's a zombie charging towards them you know, because these are fast, uh, very mobile, fast zombies. And it takes about 60 shots from, you know, these eight or nine guys to take this thing down. Because a moving target is difficult to hit. And I don't know if you guys have ever fired uh, weapons before, but Ash and I yeah. did take uh, a couple of different, um, you know, classes and we fired different weapons. And one of the guns we fired, because uh, they converted everything to shoot twenty twos, with the exception of an AK-47. Not, not, yeah, that sounds right. And the AK-47 has this insane amount of kickback. Mm-hmm. So if you're not used to shooting a gun, you know, like what we see with Tim Blake Nelson's character, 
Like, it takes him several shots. Like, he almost shoots the dog. He shoots the plant. Like, he's missing yeah. completely. Because you've got to remember, your, your adrenaline is pumping. This is a life-or-death situation. You're not just going to sit – you're not going to be – fucking uh chris redfield and just like oh i have six bullets and there's nine zombies three of you guys line up in a row so i can just shoot you right through the like that's not what's going to happen you At know least in we... the walking dead it's a matter of you know the people who can do that are the ones that survive so after a while it's a matter of okay these aren't normal people anymore these are relatively trained or at least experienced and stuff like yeah, that but, but then everybody but, but... does it everyone does like you, know, you have you have you have Norman Reedus is like oh I shot a zombie with my crossbow in high wind from you know a hundred yards away just as it was sneaking up on a no you didn't <laughs> you know yeah. like you like oh I'm Rick Grimes I have a six shooter uh, let me just you know I, or a revolver and you know oh I I took this zombie out because you know and he was a hundred yards away it's like no you didn't because that gun doesn't have that type of range and that type of accuracy like. <laughs> No, you didn't. Like, all this stuff, like, that's not realistic. Like, it looks great on TV, but it's right. not realistic. And speaking of guns, uh, did anyone else notice that Carrie Ann Moss with her uh, her revolver that had six shots, shots fired nine shots yeah. at the zombie? Yeah, we, we both did. Yeah, yeah we like, were counting, like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? Eight, nine? nine? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Like, I thought it was a funny joke. I feel like that's that was what it was, or it's just a small like first of all, design. Like right. you want to talk about, you know, people having a difficult time hitting a target. This thing was on the ground, face down, yeah. and it took her nine shots as she was standing over it. But then I, she comes out at the end of the movie, and she's you know, headshot, 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 headshot. Yeah. Which we didn't really see where on the body she shot the kid that was face down. Yeah, she was off She could have just been emotional and just, you know, unloaded on him. She didn't seem emotional, though. Did she, you, did she, she seem emotional away, to you? She walked yeah. away looking she, very stone-faced. She came back and said, okay, Timmy, let's go home. Right. She seemed she very pretty, stoic and very... She was pretty stoic through the whole yeah. movie, though. Even but at the it, end. You could still be stoic and be like, you, thinking in your mind, you shot, you're going to bite my kid, I'm going to shoot you nine times. But then... Yeah. You're standing over him with a revolver, and you have to shoot him nine times. But when you have the the shotgun, which is not known for its accuracy, you're just headshot, 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 headshot at the very end. What changed? Was, did she use the shotgun, or did she use the pistol again? I thought she used the pistol again. He had the shotgun. The, the father did. Yeah, the yeah, father but had he, the I thought he dropped it, and she picked it up. Oh, that oh. she might have, yeah. Okay. Either way, can we just acknowledge that there's a moment where the father gives his son a handgun and gives him bullets as like, you're going to, I know you're not supposed to get this till you're 12, but I, I think you'll need it. You know, don't don't be late for school now. Take your bullets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, well, I mean, all the kids, I mean, that's, you know, you're not supposed to have funny, a handgun. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, this could have been taking place in Texas today. But, <laughs> this is good you know, this is, you know, this is the world that they live in. Like, it gives you a little bit, without being overly expositive, it gives you a little bit yes. of a, a sneak in, a sneak peek into, this is what this world is like. You know, oh, you're not supposed to have a gun until you're 12 when you're responsible. Uh, right. Yeah, give, give a kid a gun right as he's going into puberty, because uh, that's when they make <laughs> all the good decisions. Uh, but you also have the fact that, you know, these kids are walking around, with, uh, you know, rifles or BB guns, and you know, what's the the biggest punishment for holding a gun on a kid? Like, oh, detention. that's it. You're going to detention, young man. I was thinking that. I'm like, hold on a second. Now that is that is the one time where the military will beat you is if you're in training and you aim your gun at somebody, regardless of loading status. That kid had a loaded, even if it was a BB gun, a loaded BB gun at point blank range. And all he got was a slap on the wrist detention for two hours. And <laughs> when he tells his mother, she's like, oh, did people see you with a dirty shirt? Like, <laughs> like that's her reaction. He pulled a gun on me. <gasps> and people saw you with dirt on your collar. <gasps> Go, go to hell, you piece of shit. <laughs> Don't play baseball by yourself. It makes you look lonely. <laughs> yeah. That, that was something I noticed was that they were really, really bad parents at the beginning. Even Carrie Ann Moss. But it really took a lot of, like, I don't want to say trauma, but the, it, Timmy had to be in a very, um, very rough situation for his parents to finally, like, show up 
and care a yeah. lot of that stuff. Gary and Moss had a lot more screen time with Fido, but the dad at the end was like, no, I'm a good father, and runs in to save his son, which, you know, <laughs> he did. Which at least he gets points for that, you know, finally fucking putting his, you know, taking his balls out of his wife's purse and, you know, trying to do something even though he failed miserably. I, he, he, I get the whole he was traumatized by having to kill his own father at 11. That's a big thing, actually, is a lot of the... At least the, the, the men were kind of affected by the war. of the, You know, the adults were affected by the war because they were children at the time. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the dad was in it was 11, and the, um, the bottom, Bottoms was fighting in the war. He's right. a decorated war hero. So it, they don't really go into it with Carrie Ann Moss's character, but this is, a, this is like the next generation of kids who didn't grow up with the war. They're growing up with the aftermath of the war. But they still have to kill matters. zombies. Yes, they still have to kill zombies, but I feel like that kind of matters in how they deal with the problem. I mean, right. there are scouts for Zom for Zomcon, and they're you know Zomcon fanatics. They love it. You know, they're super ready to get on their high horse and you know shoot zombies. And the the poor the poor single kid who doesn't really have his family is all there, and you know he just, he's not the best, but he's not complete garbage. He's not unnerved by ever seeing a zombie. So, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of undertones with how the war treated people and, yes, and parenting absolutely. and how they changed over time. Absolutely. But I wanted to say about the casting, those two kids that played the bullies, didn't you just want to fucking punch them in the face? Oh, they had those faces. They had very punchable yeah. faces. <laughs> and I, I felt like that was that was good casting on their part. Yes, it, was, yeah. not this, it wasn't really their face. It was the look on their face. This, yeah. like, this almost almost mad that somebody else has has a good thing going for them yeah and that's really i think it works but i wanted to hit them <laughs> oh yeah yeah those kids sucked it's just like <laughs> look what you did you stupid zombie you made me shoot my brother yeah yeah he killed his brother <laughs> he shoots the zombie right through kills the brother oh no you made me kill my stupid brother you zombie <laughs> how could you you're the problem <laughs> how dare you not How dare you get tied up by us and then, you know, the be part of our plan? The collar gets broken by them. They, br they break the collar. The zombie tries to eat them. They're upset at the right. zombie. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's yeah. that's the, the, the type of uh, society that they're growing up in. It's like, it's the zombie's fault. It's like, it's really not. Like, if you get mauled by a tiger because you have a tiger in your house, that's your fault. Tigers Apparently don't belong in your in house. Everyone has a tiger. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's in India, yeah. not in everybody. <laughs> well, that's what I heard. <laughs> and it is funny too how, you know, the 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 villains in the piece are mostly the humans. You know, uh, I almost said Bub again. Uh, uh, Fido. Fido. The title of the movie. The title character. <laughs> You know, he's not uh, evil at all. In fact, one of the first things he does with the collar on is protect Timmy from the bullies. Yeah. Which was, I thought was interesting. I thought, you know, I was curious how that happened. I guess he wasn't trying to eat them. So the collar prevents you from eating people, but you can yes. still attack them. That's what they establish is that it, the collar doesn't it just, it just stops their, like, their hunger, their bloodlust right. for killing people. But at no point did they say it makes them completely nonviolent. It makes them follow orders. Right. And I, I don't know. I feel like that kind of, that kind of works. You know, it, it wasn't some some um, issue with continuity. It was no that they established that. Yeah. I'm surprised that Fido didn't get any trouble for breaking the kid's arm. I know. That's well, he all didn't, I could think of. Nobody believed him. <laughs> that's also oh, that's true. true. Yeah. I was I was thinking of um. Um, like the the hippogriff scene in the third Harry Potter movie, where Malfoy runs up to the to the hippogriff that Harry very carefully respected and got to ride, and then of course Malfoy gets injured, and his father, you know, blames the the hippogriff for doing that when in fact Malfoy just runs up to a wild animal, told by the teacher not to, and gets himself in trouble. Well, same thing with uh, with uh, Joffrey in Game of Thrones in season one when the uh, you know he attacks Arya. And uh, Nymeria, the wolf, steps in and, like, grabs him and knocks him down. He's like, oh, look at my scars. Oh, I was nearly killed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there's something I was going to say about that, too, but I, I, I'll get back to that. Um, there's one thing. Uh, Pat, you might remember this better than probably Spencer, although you said you remembered some of the um, trailers, too. I would swear there was a scene in the film where the family's at the dinner table and for whatever reason in the conversation, they're talking about how people have zombies. And Timmy says, oh, man, why can't we have a zombie? 
is that just a Mandela effect? Did I dream that? You why don't you go watch the trailer to see? Well, yeah, I just didn't get a chance to. I mean, that, I, I, thought I I that don't that remember. Happened. It's a probably but a like, deleted scene that they just used for the trailer. Yeah. Or it's just one of those things that they shot for the trailer, and you know, kind of. Because uh, he didn't seem, in the movie, he didn't seem, like, overly keen to get one. He didn't really care. But, like, it was a status symbol for uh, for Helen. Because it's like, right. oh, we're the only sure. ones in the neighborhood without one. It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like getting the latest appliance. They yeah. think we're weird. We don't have a zombie. What was I supposed to tell the new neighbor? <laughs> they have six, and we don't even have one. Like, yeah. it's like, what kind of, what kind of, you know... Like, what would be the analog to that? You know, a TV? <laughs> right. Like, maybe yeah. a TV. A color or... TV. Yeah. Color TV. I mean, on the note of the trailer, I feel like that line, though, kind of sums up what the movie is about. Oh, well, the Johnsons have a zombie. Why can't we get one? Right, yeah. It very much gives you that jokingly 1950s vibe, and we're talking about zombies, and it's definitely not taking itself seriously. That's all you really needed, at least for, for getting somebody to go see a movie. Oh, it's a it's a movie about people have zombies as pets. What more do you need to go watch this movie to understand what it's about without ever seeing it? Right? It's definitely a, a, I think it's definitely you know that that angle is definitely a a commentary on you know the the American view on capitalism. You know, you know, a chicken in every pot and two cars in every garage. You know, like that that whole thing. You know, from the fifties. Yeah, yeah. You're like, spend, 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 spend. Now right. that the war is over. <laughs> I, I can't afford another funeral. That's <laughs> what you're thinking about when your wife tells you she's pregnant? Not, I can't afford another mouth to feed. I can't afford another funeral. Right, right. <laughs> you know, that would have been something I would have been interested to know about is how their economy works. If you're, Obviously, they're not completely isolated in these walled-off towns. They're somehow able to not only communicate, but get goods back and forth, like vehicles and food and clothes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the fenced-off areas are probably, you know, they probably city plan around the fenced-off areas, you know, or worst case, you know, as they do in Black Summer, supply drops by airplanes or That's helicopters. I yeah. I definitely got a vibe of, I mean, obviously the... um the show I'm about to reference came out much later, but it was a very much a vibe of Attack on Titan where humanity lives behind walls, and if you go outside these walls, the wild monsters will come and kill you. And it's not to say that you can't go outside the walls, you will never survive, but it's uninhabitable. It's going, it's going to be overrun instantly no matter what you try to do. So My only question know. when it comes to any of those types of things, you know, Attack on Titan or this or you know, like Land of the Dead, you know, any of those types of things. Like, if this is such a prevalent problem, and there are so many of these things, how the hell do you have time to build these giant walls? Like, I get with with this, you know, it's quick, you know, throwing up some, uh, some chain link fencing and, you know, maybe fortifying behind that afterwards with armed guards and watchtowers and whatnot. But it's like, you know, looking at... You know, even World War Z, where they built that huge wall around uh, uh, Israel. <laughs> right. They explained yeah. like, that, though. They were like, yeah, no, we're, we're not taking chances again. The Jews are not taking chances again. I was like, that's reasonable. But it's like, as soon as, you, as soon as you have this, uh, you know, like, oh, we're being swarmed and overwhelmed. And, like, you know, we have to literally go to war in order to stop this. It's like, how do you have the time? How can you gather the reason? Especially an attack on Titan. It's like... How do you have the time and the ability to, you know, like, because think about all the stones for these giant walls that they use. How do you have the time and the resources if you're constantly fighting off, because the, they didn't have, you know, any you of have, the, the defense forces at the beginning. You've definitely not watched or, or read it because it, it, they, they explain it, but it's not very um, realistic. It's not meant to be realistic. No, it's not plausible. I've seen the, I've seen the show, you know, okay. but what I'm saying is, like, you have to simultaneously fight off this invasion of these basically unstoppable uh, creatures. You don't know how to kill them yet, but you're also building a wall at the same time. It's like, yeah, I, you're probably just throwing wave after wave after wave of expendable people just, you know, to, to you know, keep them away from what you're doing and distract them. But, like, that seems like a terrible idea to me. Yeah, yeah. 
Ah, yeah, it works in this context, and it, you know, in other things, it it doesn't always work. It's kind of interesting because it's the opposite of some other more recent zombie things that have come out. Where now, before it was we're contained from the zombies, from the wild. Now, you know, it's some some later stuff, you know, some later games, uh, some Army of the Dead, the, that movie that just recently came out. The zombies are the ones that are contained now. It kinda, yeah, but it kind of almost that reverses one. in a matter of in a matter of time, though. I think that's kind of an interesting thought: is that it switched over from zombies rule the world and we just kind of live in it to no, 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 no. The world hasn't ended. It's just this section of the world has ended. Yeah, and even that one, it's like, oh yeah, we were able to fly in all these uh, all these uh, you know container units and just kind of block off las vegas it's like first of all how'd you get everybody to vegas second of all how'd you get all these things like that doesn't make any sense because you know that there's going to be stragglers you know that there's going to be some that got out there's going to be people who got bit that are like i didn't get bit you know like what we've seen for the past year and a half you think you could contain a zombie outbreak i also have a reason to believe that as soon as patient zero got out in the beginning of the movie they were ready to go all right let's let's table army of the dead because we're going to cover that on another episode <laughs> no, i'm just you know in in general any of those types yeah. of things but the chain link well, fence and fido definitely definitely works because the zombies aren't strong and something that this movie has that say for example the walking dead or, or vice versa the, well actually the, the fido and the walking dead each have something that the other doesn't have and it changes the whole dynamic the walking dead has people building walls and stuff and trying to fortify themselves and protect themselves but they've got other pockets of humanity that aren't necessarily evil but want what the main characters of the show have so there's constant struggle to maintain these fortified areas whereas in this movie they have zomcon so there is no there are at least as far as we can tell i mean from what the story tells us there aren't roaming groups of bandits or if there are they haven't been enough to to topple one of these towns and basically bring the collapse to society as we know it. Yeah, these aren't cities. These are suburbs. Yeah. Well, not only that is, you know, it's the 1950s, so the types and availability of weapons are going to be greatly different than now. You know, like if you think about the amount of, you know, nobody had any automatic rifles you know, no one was, uh, you know, nobody had any Kalashnikovs, even though they would have been available, but there were no, like, you know, AK-47s. You know, people had, you know, bolt-action rifles and handguns and shotguns. Yeah, it I wasn't... noticed that. M1 yeah. Garands and Car 98s, yeah. Nobody's walking around with, you know, you know, AR-15s or, you know, grenades or, you know, if you were, if this were to happen today or, like, any of the movies that we see that come out, you know, in this time period or the past, you know, 30 years, you know, everybody's always, you know, armed to the teeth. There's always some guy with a friggin' minigun and, you know, mounted yeah. <laughs> to his mounted to his truck. And, you know, you don't see that. Everybody's driving around in Studebakers, you know, like it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's all the, the same, you know, everybody's the same. Like that's where you get the fifties aesthetic for it. And I think that really helps with the story because you don't have, you know, people standing there, you know, like we were talking about earlier, you know, with their, with their aim and everything. It's like, well, if I have a, a, a gun that fires, you know, 100 bullets in, you know, 20 seconds, you know, even a blind squirrel finds a nut now and then. You know what I mean? Like, you, right. you're, you're going to hit them or at least, you know, shred through them enough where they're immobile. That's true. You know, That's if you true. only have six bullets and then you – or nine in your revolver and you have to reload you know it's going to be a lot different like everybody had revolvers nobody had you know guns with you know clips in them you know what Only i mean like the, um the military guy did when he pulled that out i was like oh you got some hardware right no one else had revolvers and bolt actions he had he had a real like a nine millimeter yeah, yeah. Had, well that's what i'm talking clip. about like when you see the spread in the town like nobody's got that type of gun whereas now right. Everyone would have like six of them strapped to their legs, and then two in the back. You know, it's going to be like yeah. you know, Billy Connolly in 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 uh, I almost said Reservoir Dogs, Boondock Saints, Boondock Saints, yeah. where he's got six guns, and he's just like, oh, these are empty. I'll throw them aside. These are empty. I'll throw them aside. These are you know, <laughs> I've got sixty, seventy shots, so guns. I'm all set. Lots of guns. Yeah, yeah. You know, the Matrix. You know, like yeah. that's what. 
you know, that scene in the first Matrix when they walk into the, the, the lobby to go rescue uh, oh, yeah. uh, Morpheus. I mean, like, that's what you'd be looking at. Like, that's yeah. that's what today's zombie movies are. Right. You know, and there's going to be some crazy asshole with, like, C4 or Semtex. Like. Yeah, th- yeah. There's, there's no, like, it looks like there's no shortage of ammunition. It's just a shortage of, you know, how much do we want to teach people. Yeah, the kids have a basic understanding of shooting BB guns, but a zombie shows up, only one of the neighbors who was there and saw it come out of the woodwork runs in with his gun. It's not like they were all ready for it. Right. It wasn't the whole neighborhood suddenly popped up with their rifles, you know, oh, we were ready to go. No, it was one guy who was not very good at it. So, kind of... Right, kinda and then, and then a along. scout. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and her. I thought when they were taking the rifle class at school, I thought they actually had 22s. But I think when they the were BB guns. Were out, they were what? I think they were all BB guns because, oh, you they know, were all you're BB. not supposed to have them. I mean, they were shooting at paper targets. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Or cardboard or whatever it was, yeah. you know, so. You want to hand an untrained 10-year-old a real 22? Yeah. <laughs> no, I was just, I, 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 for some reason, thought those were real guns, but then when the two bullies were out by themselves, they had BB guns. I, I did that first, too, and then I heard them shoot it. Well, because he even, he even, uh, he even said, he's like, oh, you shot me with the BB gun. Yeah, well, that, yeah, when they were out. But I, I meant in the, just in the classroom setting, the outside the building there. I mean, they may have had, you know, uh, access to long guns, and maybe that's why, you know, Dylan Baker says, you know, you're not supposed to have a handgun until you're 12. Right. You know, so you can you can use, you know, a 22 because I don't think a BB gun is shooting through a zombie and into, you know, another kid and killing him. Yeah, yeah. But I think maybe they had both, or, like, maybe the, the, the fat kid had the 22, the, the BB gun because he sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, they don't really get into it, but. Yeah, that's true. So here's a question. Uh, I have one last question here about zombies that I've never thought of before, and then we'll start to wrap things up here. Watching this movie, they're talking about the zombies eating, and when, when Carrie Ann Moss says he doesn't have to eat, eat, but he can eat. Drink. So what about, so let's say a zombie comes in, and takes a big chunk out of my arm. Pretty much eats all the flesh off of my arm. Where does that go? Do zombies poop? Um, I would imagine if there's any... Um... I imagine you just go right through them, dude. Like a, like a dead body would, you know, how... Because the organs the... aren't functioning. But the muscles are all still there. They're just not being used. So I imagine that... And plus, a lot of the time, they actually aren't eating that much of the person. They're just biting them, killing them, and then for some reason, they kind of move on. Especially in this one. This happens a lot. They, they bite a guy, he dies, and then it's like, oh, Fido, wait, look out over there. Oh, okay, cool. I, I took a bite, the guy bled to death, we called it a day. There weren't, like, there weren't, there weren't skeletons, you know? There weren't, like, mostly, dis, mostly, you know, eaten remains. It was, like, one limb or one chunk of the body was attacked, and it kind of stopped after that. Well, usually they were interrupted. That's why. Like, it all depends on... See, I I think it all depends on who's telling the story. Like, if I'm telling the story, maybe I have it so, you know, the uh, nothing gets digested. So, you know, whatever chunks of flesh are, are chewed and swallowed, because I don't think there's a lot of chewing going on. But you're swallowing, and it's just building up inside you your stomach will rupture and eventually your stomach will distend and you'll spill open and all like you know these half chewed chunks of flesh will spill out of your you know distended stomach kind of like the uh the the gluttony guy in seven. Oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that was real real nice description there thanks <laughs> i mean it might take it, it'll take a long time and i think it would definitely slow down whatever zombie you know it might even you know if you're thinking about it you know you've got these you know decaying zombies and the thing you know it's just eating and eating and eventually the uh tendons and bones can't handle it anymore and it just shatters and just like lays Whoa. there <laughs> and whatever whatever happens to walk by uh you know he just grabs Please, Pat, you're turning me on. Stop. <laughs> well, you know, I can't help that. <laughs> okay, so on that, word, on that thought, uh, final thoughts on Fido, Spence? 
Uh, very, very fun. Very different from every other zombie movie. Um, it's a, it's a good comedy. Has the zombie gore. If you're walking into it expecting a, a light-hearted zombie film, you're gonna walk out of it pretty happy. So all in all, I give it a, eight and a half out of ten. Really, really good. Well done, all around. A warm hearted tale of a boy and his pet zombie. <laughs> Pat, I mean, I, I highly recommend this. Like I. I mean, I suggested it for us to cover, so you know, I I, uh, I definitely think that this is something that folks should check out, you know, because you know, like Spence said, this is a uh, a very uh, a very different take on the zombie genre. You know, it it does set forth specific rules, and you know, again, you don't get uh, overly exposited, you know, but you know, it's you know, it's not the bite, it's the radiation that affects everyone. So that when you die, you immediately come back. Um, I 100% recommend this to anybody who is a, a fan of uh, the zombie genre, especially if you like zombie comedies, because um, it's just it's one of the funniest, uh, you know, horror comedies out there. I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, I, I can't quite put it up with, say, you know, Shaun of the Dead or Tucker and Dale versus Evil. But it's it's definitely up there. It's a it's a really good one. Uh, it's got quality acting from you know recognizable actors that you know you've seen in a bunch of stuff that uh, maybe step outside their comfort zone a little bit. You know, like uh, Carrie Ann Moss and and uh, and um, uh, Billy Connolly. Yeah, I mean Dylan Baker and Tim Blake Nelson, like this is this is a slow Tuesday for them. Like they can do they can do anything, like um, you know, playing these types of characters. So uh yeah, I, I think it's great, you know, the, the, the mashup of you know, fifties nostalgia combined with the gore of a zombie film, uh, it just works. I agree. I agree. I definitely recommend this movie as well. Um, it does fill that zombie need, but it's also uh, it's it's comedy. So for people who are a little squeamish about zombies, uh, zombies, I think they'll enjoy this movie as well. May may have to cover their eyes through a couple parts, but um, yeah, I I loved it. I forgot how well done it was. Uh, I have to say, I hadn't seen it in a long time. And there's lots of layers to it. There's lots of subtlety. Like, and we don't have to get into it because we didn't really talk about it. But the whole thing about the elderly. You know, the whole subtext there could be construed as, um, you know, an ana- not an anagram, but a, um, an analogy allegory. of allegory about, like, ageism or racism or, you know, picking a, a group and identifying them as a potential threat. You know? There's always but a the- boogeyman, especially in the 50s. Instead of this being communist, it's don't trust the elderly because they'll exactly. turn on you. Yeah, exactly. It's I'll like McCarthyism. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what a time! On top of that, there's a um a lot of a lot of irony in in the way they deal with the genres. You know, some of the moments we've established. You know, like um, the kid gets the gun, or oh, you ate Mrs. Henderson. You know, stuff like that. That out of context sounds hysterical, but in the context of the movie, it really fits. So watch sitting through it. It's it's funny to us, but it isn't out of place or seemingly not trying to uh, seemingly trying to pander or ruin any part of the movie. It all fits. I agree. I agree. And, um, you know, like I said, the acting was good too. There was one scene towards the very end, which I won't give it away, but, um, uh, Timmy's talking to the little girl, uh, Cindy, and, um, she's basically telling him what she calls her new zombie. And just the look on his face makes the whole movie right there. Where he just has this, uh, okay, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of subtlety, and there isn't a lot of. I I know this is weird about fiction, but it it doesn't break the immersion of what it's trying to do at any point. The acting is on point. I think the writing is on point. The details of the story and how the world works is very very clear. But it, if you go too far into it, yeah, you'll find all the cracks and kinks because it's just a fictional story. So it's pretty good. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, guys, for joining me on this one. And oh, look course. forward to talking to you again on uh, on another uh, zombie-related episode.
Okay, folks, thanks for joining us today for our special 2021 13 Days of Hallowtober series where we focus on modern zombie films. You can send your feedback to thenisnow42 at gmail.com, and you can also join in the conversation at our Facebook Then Is Now podcast group. And you can find me at uh, the Throwdown Thursday Facebook group, uh, throwdownthursdaypodcast.com, and you know, uh, hanging around in the dorkening. Uh, the uh, Then Is Now podcast is a proud member of the uh, Dorkening Podcast Network, so be sure to check out that uh, that awesome show, because, you know, I'm a little biased, but uh, mm-hmm. but check out that show and all the other great shows there at thedorkening.com. You can also visit our website at havenpodcast.com, where you find our sister show, The East, East Meets the West, which is, again, another amazing show that I'm a little biased about, in which we discuss Shaw Brothers films and spaghetti western movies kind of uh, coexisting together in the world. Exactly, exactly. And Then Is Now is on YouTube, so please visit youtube.com slash user slash Uncle Death One to get the latest videos as well as other fun videos. Please subscribe to our YouTube page and also share the video versions of our podcast with your friends and get them to subscribe as well. Don't forget to go wherever you download your podcast from and leave us a great review so that more listeners can find us. You could find us on all the podcasting apps, especially the big three, iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Class dismissed. The Venice Now podcast is intended for entertainment, educational, and informational purposes only. Sounds, music, and clips played during this podcast are the property of their copyright holders. All original content is copyright Jupiter Media. shows like the one you just heard check out the dorkening podcast network at the dorkening.com